there your Bible, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I uh, formerly was a member of an international mission board, and I would get uh, mission letters from different missionaries, especially in Africa, which I was uh, on the board for an overseer with. And so I have a missionary letter uh, from one of our missionaries from Ivory Coast, uh, and I post Africa. And his letter goes this, how long has it been since you've heard a wild African snake story? <laughs> well, this goes, it isn't very wild, but it's about an African snake. Missionary goes on to say, we have two royal pythons, both of which we have picked up on the road during our dark night travels. One has been captive for a year, the other was found maybe two months ago. Since we weren't sure how well the two would adjust, we added a guinea pig. To the cage at the same time, sort of standard meal for the old snake. Normally, unless molting, the snake will have a meal within a few minutes or hours or a day, but with the new snake present, I guess he wasn't really interested. We finally had to start feeding the pig after it kept crying every time we would walk by. When it was frightened, she would run away from us and run and curl up with the snakes just for the comfort. This became a great source of interest to everyone who stopped by and wanted to see the snakes and the guinea pig. They always wanted to check to see how the guinea was living peacefully with the serpents. Then one morning, after about eight weeks, I heard Penny, as we called him, cry out, and a little later I went in to give him some lettuce, and I discovered that was her last cry, as she had already been suffocated and half swallowed by the snake. We have no idea when the snake decided that was the day, but when it did, there was no warning for the trusting little snake. Well, I know some of you are squirming by now. Great for the missionary alert. Uh, but this is the way life is. The analogy here seems very strong. Do you catch the analogy? Here we have the snake, the ultimate symbol of sin and Satan, and the guinea pig actually running to the snake for protection in pure innocence and extraordinary ignorance. How comforting and safe it seemed. It was more afraid of the people that were feeding it than it was of the companion until one day it was literally consumed. The Bible makes clear that the tactics of the devil fall into two major divisions. We're looking at the back of your bulletin also if you want to follow along. Also, you need the scriptures that uh, you looked at already. He attacks the human race both directly and indirectly. He is capable of direct confrontation with human beings and also in an in indirect way. And through these two avenues, he maintains his worldwide control over the race of men. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible indicates that there are fallen hosts of angels called demons, whom Paul then will call in this verse here, principalities, powers, world rulers of this present darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, just to understand, heavenly places here does not mean far away. Heavenly places basically means the realm of the invisible. The invisible realities of life. The devil and his hosts are not visible. That is what he is saying. The devil's activity is in the realm of the invisible reality of what life is. The heavenly places where God works is also where Satan works. In the Bible, we are told very little of the origin of the devil and his, uh, and his angels. These principalities and powers, uh, there is enough suggestion here that they were being created originally as an angel of might and strength and beauty and power. As you look at the passage that, that you have in front of you, Ezekiel 28, there's a brief reference to the fall of the great angel, whose name was Lucifer, and who was lifted by his pride. Ezekiel 28. Pride is always the mark of the devil. Pride is always the mark of the devil. Interesting what month this is. Lifted up by pride, he chose to rival God, and in doing so, he fell from his station of might and glory and beauty and became the devil. He drew a third of the angels with him, and we'll talk about that next week. And these constitute the principalities and powers, the organized kingdom of darkness, as opposed to the kingdom of God. It is through these hosts of wicked spirits that Satan is able to make a direct assault upon our lives. This direct assault covers what the Bible says 
One is the aspect of demon possession. In other words, the outright taking over of a human personality by the power of a wicked spirit. It also extends to such activities as soothsaying, occultism, spiritism or spiritualism, uh, related black magic arts, astrology, horoscopes, Buddhism, fortune telling. And let's be very careful here. There's a word of warning here. There's no question about what there is some chicanery and deception that is a part of this whole field of what we quote unquote call black magic. There are charlatans at work who make their living off of superstitious fears of people and who engage in deceptive tricks which give the assumption that they are genuinely sort of dealing with the occult. The Bible consistently warns against dabbling in these matters. Under the law of the Bible in Israel, they were strictly forbidden of participating in any way with wizards. It's interesting, the word for wizards was peep and mutter. Those who try to make contact with the dead by peep and mutter, and, or those who deal with the world of the cult. The prohibition was largely because any investigation, any investigation into the realm immediately lays one open to the powers beyond and makes possible for control and for influence beyond the will of the individual who's trying to investigate. In other words, what I'm saying here is this is dangerous ground. It, all, it opens the way oftentimes to outright demon possession. As to the subject of demon possession, I'm very well aware that there are many people who raise their eyebrows incredibly when we talk about that subject. And they say, surely you don't believe in that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, I mean, people say this is the 21st century, but you're not telling us that there are such things as demons. After all, the days in which the Bible were read were back in primitive times, and people believed in all sorts of types of things. And so today we are better informed. What was once called demon possession, we now understand it's only mental illness, and we can treat it with drugs and other therapy. And you reply to that kind of person who says that to you? Well, they're written on the back of your bulletin. First of all, the Bible itself is careful to distinguish between mental illness and demon possession. Understand that. The Bible is not a permanent book that is written by people some, that some imagine. But the Bible is a very distinct in putting down as to what these two things are. The writers of Scripture were certainly aware of the distinction. One of them, Luke, was a physician in himself and was certainly acquainted with the distinction between disease, mental illness, and demon possession. In Matthew chapter 4, a careful distinction is made between those who were afflicted by disease Matthew 4, 24, those who are demon-possessed, those who are diseased, and those who are lunatic or mentally ill. All of those statements are made there in Matthew. Dr. Luke even refers to the same thing back in his book, Luke chapter 4. A second thing is, it's important to notice that the biblical case of demon-possession do not conform to the clinical pattern of any known mental disease. Understand that. That the biblical case of demon-possession does not conform to any clinical pattern pattern of any known mental disease. There are diseases of the body, there are diseases of the mind. Diseases of the mind, like those of the body, present themselves clinically with patterns that you can recognize. But when you examine carefully the biblical accounts of demon possession, you find these do not fit into the standard pattern of what we would call mental disease. They are not the same thing. They do not conform. In the pattern, there is always a debasing element in biblical cases of human possession. There's an uncleanness. There's a moral debasement. In the biblical accounts of human possession, there was an immediate recognition by the demon within the character of the person to identify Jesus. In other words, the demon's inside this person, and the demon speaks about Jesus. When Christ approached these demons, uh, in the biblical account, he says this, that when Christ approached these demons, many times they would call out and say, what do we have to do with you, son of God? In other words, they call him by a name, they call him by a title, which the victim, the person that's possessed, would have never understood or never even known that Jesus was who that is. 
There is so often this immediate strange recognition of the authority of Jesus. The pattern also is that the presence of a totally distinct, different personality involved. In some cases, many personalities were involved. Jesus dealt with one in Luke, in Luke chapter 8, the story of the guy who said, I am legion, meaning that there were many demons within him. There is the ability on the part of Christ to transfer demons from individuals to animals. How do we explain that if that's just a mental disease? How do you explain the case of the Gadarene swine in Luke chapter 8? If a demon possession is merely mental illness, how do you put the mental illness into a bunch of pigs? If it's only a hallucination, if it's only some kind of schizophrenia, then how do you explain the demons leaving the man, going into the pigs, and then running into the ocean or the sea and drowning? These cases simply do not conform to any kind of clinical pattern of any kind of mental disease. A third factor, back to your bulletin, is that Jesus himself invariably described these cases as demon possession. This is what he said they were. And he treated them that way. He dealt with this kind of thing continuously. He sent out his disciples. Remember what he said to his disciples when they went out? I give you authority of casting out demons. Someone says, well, we have an explanation for that. It's simply a recognition that Jesus was accommodating himself to the people of his day. In other words, they were believing this kind of stuff, and so Jesus sort of adapted his teaching to sort of recognize this stuff himself. They believed in demons and devils, and he is simply speaking their language. But it's impossible to take that kind of perspective consistent with the rest of the account of Christ's ministry. For we see him constantly correcting misconceptions. Remember what he said to his disciples? He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He was always there to miss or to correct misconceptions that were taking place. Number four, as the last suggestion along this line, throughout the Christian centuries, there have been various outbreaks of demon possession that have been described by missionaries. I took a class in seminary in demonology by my professor. My professor was not very strong about wanting to feel that demons were real until he went to Africa. As a missionary representative, and there he was in a meeting, and people were cast, they were casting out demons. It was interesting. It was the elders that were over on the side casting out demons. He said, I didn't believe any of this until I saw a guy float from the middle of the aisle out to the center. Then I began to start believing in this demon thing. It is significant, I think, that whenever Christian teaching spreads, whenever Christianity spreads, the direct assault against the evil powers begins to be shown. And as our world grows more and more godless and more and more secular, we, have, we will find an increasing tide of demonic manifestation creeping into our culture and insinuating itself into our civilized life. There's no power in man to withhold this. There's no power within us to stand against this. It is only because of God. Yet there is altogether, at the same time, too much concern among Christians about this matter of the imposition. That sounds, all, sounds like I'm almost contradicting myself here. But I am wanting to say that we need to be concerned about balancing it. Certain Christians who feel they must bind Satan before they can do anything. I really have t difficulty with that, trying to find that in the New Testament. That gives absolutely no warrant for that type of approach. The apostles very seldom mention, it's interesting, the apostles very seldom mention any attack, direct attack by Satan. There are a few instances of it, but after our Lord physically left, there seems to be sort of a, a lessening of the aspect of dealing with this. Well, we need to be in prayer. Those dark powers were stirred by his presence. It's interesting when Jesus was there in that time period that we see demonic attack taking place. So that when you get to the epistles, there's much, much about Satan in the letters of, there's not much about Satan in the letters of Paul, but there is, there's much about Satan, but there's a little direct attack that takes place in the epistles. Whereas when you see what the, the Gospels deal, the Gospels deal with de demonic oppression very much. Number six, the majority of the attacks of the devil against Christians are not direct. They are indirect. And that is why they are called the wilds 
the wiles of the devil. In other words, wildness, as the King James says it, means devious. It means circuitry. It means something not obvious. A direct attack of the devil upon a human life, uh, life is, obvious, is an obvious thing, but this is something devious. It's something circuitous. It is something that is not detectable, at least not easily. The major attack of the devil and his powers upon human life is not by direct means, but indirect, by satanic suggestion. Through the natural, complex, uh, commonplace channels that happen in our life. Let me put it to you this way. There is a passage in Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to look at that in your Bible, or you can look at it, it's right there on your sheet of paper. Uh, the indirect approach comes largely through two means. One is the world, the other is the flesh. Often we hear the words that the enemies of the Christian life are what? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, there's not three. There's only one. There's only one enemy, one enemy, and that is the devil. But it will be the channels that he will use to approach you will be through the world and the flesh. If you'd like to understand this better, here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Christians, and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. Hmm. So there's the first transmission. It happens through the world that gives you direction and guidance. And who is the world ruled by? Next phrase. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, the ruler of this world is Satan. And you are being pressured by the world to follow what Satan wants you to do. Go on to uh, the next part of that verse, verse 3. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and follow its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. So we are not aware of any control of the devil. You know, nobody says, well, I don't feel the devil doing anything, telling me what to do today. You did what you feel like. You, basically, you did what you feel like doing. But you understand, that's your flesh. Isn't that what the verse is aiming at? It's aiming at what your flesh tells you to do. And we tend to, we tend to basically just sort of go with the natural stimuli of what my flesh wants me to do. And because we are doing these things, following the course of this world under the direction of the prince of the power of the air, Obey the impulses that our body and our mind give us. So what do we do about this? The most basic of these two channels or means or approach to subverting the Christian life is your flesh. The Bible speaks about the flesh. And by the way, when you talk about the flesh, usually it's talking about it in symbolic ways. Many of us, when we approach middle age, are troubled with too much flesh. <laughs> A little humor, just want to make sure you guys are still with us. Okay. Uh, but that is not the sense in which the Bible is talking about. The Bible is not talking about flesh uh, in terms of bodies of blood and bones and meat. In other words, our physical aspect. It is a term which is describing the urge to ourselves of self-centeredness. Our flesh is that we want to do for us. And the self-centeredness within us is the distortion of our human nature, which makes us want to be our own God. We're going back all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 with Eve. You'll be God. And so we'll be God, and so we have a proud ego, that un un the uncrucified self, which is the seat of willful defiance. In other words, I am not going to do what God wants me to do. And so we rebel against the authority that God has over our lives. I'm in charge, not God. You recognize that we were all born with this. None of us had to go to school or learn how to do these things. Nobody had to teach you how to lie. Nobody had to teach you how to be proud or bitter or rebellious or defiant or self-centered. We never had to take classes for any of that. 
In fact, we were all experts by the time that we did start going to school. We were all born with flesh, and it's that presence of that flesh which makes us sinners. James calls this wisdom which is from beneath, which is earthly, sensual, devilish, devilish. So there's the devil. It is the devil attacking indirectly through the essential character of our human nature that distorts it, twists it, changes it from what God designed you to be. You can see the satanic origin of this in the fact that it's a distortion of the beauty which God intended man to have. You're all familiar with a verse called Romans 3.23. It's interesting, a translation of that is, everyone who has sinned and has missed the beauty of God's plan. The world, on the other hand, is a corporate expression of all the flesh-centered individuals who make up the human race. In other words, since the flesh is every one of us, we are acting satanic and devilish and sensual and earthly, wherefore the total combined expression that then comes out of this is the world. And it, it, it begins the, it constitutes the philosophy of what the world is about. Is that uh, tremendous pressure of the majority upon the minority. You gotta conform. You gotta adjust to what we want you to be. You need to keep in step. You're not to progress. You're not to be different. I think we've been told that a lot this month. When the Bible addresses itself to Christians to say, do not be conformed to this world, do not let the world basically, Romans 12, 1, squeeze you. The world will squeeze you into the mold that it wants for you to be. You can't talk like that. You can't say those things. You need to be conformed. Why? Because the world is flesh-centered, flesh-governed. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And it, Jesus said to Nicodemus, it needs a new birth. It needs to be changed. It needs to be born of the Spirit. So, this is the world, that human society, which is, insists on satanic value judgments. It's guided by satanic pride and philosophy. It's totally aware of it, and yet, nevertheless, it's under the control of that kind of philosophy. The goal which Satan has for all of us is a clever strategy in which he keeps the human race in bondage. And he has been doing this for these past hundreds of centuries. His desire is to destroy you. His desire is to ruin you. His desire is to make waste of your life. That is what he's aiming at with you. That's what he's aiming at with me. And against this, we who are Christians are called to battle. And we are to battle not just for ourselves, but we are to battle also for others. Now in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul says that these phrases that we mentioned, flesh and blood, Rulers, authorities, powers, spiritual forces. Our warfare with the devil and all of his evil angels, they are significant forces that Paul is referring to in the passage. The New Testament tells us there are some four facts about the devil that we need to know. First of all, that he's a ruler. In other words, there are evil angels also with him, or what we would call demons. And they are a part of his kingdom. And his desire is to bring all, and by the way, all the unsaved, those that are not believers in Christ, are in that kingdom. The unsaved are in the kingdom. So Satan's not attacking anybody that's already in his kingdom. He's only attacking those that are not in the kingdom. That's us. When Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers, they were formerly dead in their sins. He was saying the same about us. We, he, we used to live in our sins when we followed the ways of the world, the ruler of the kingdom of the Saracen, he says in Ephesians 2. We also used to follow the devil because we were all in his kingdom, under his rule. When God commissioned Paul, he seriously, Paul was sent to the Gentiles, basically, with another word to say, he was sent to the unsaved. He was sent there to go from darkness to light. In other words, he was there to change them from darkness to light and to take them out of the power of Satan to the power of God. Not only does Satan hold the unsaved under his reign, but he also binds the minds of unbelievers. That's why the unbeliever has, you're kidding. What are you talking about? It? That's 
actually, come on, this isn't real. And you look at that, and, it's, and that's why witnessing is so difficult. Witnessing is difficult. It's like pouring water on a duck's back. It just sort of runs off. And our speech comes like we're speaking a foreign language. Young believer, just, it just goes right by. Can't understand what you're saying. And when we witness to someone, we are launching an attack upon Satan's kingdom. And we cannot win that attack by our own power. Because the person is under Satan's dominion. Jesus said we cannot enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions until we first bind the strong man. That devil that we need to be able to have the door open. The Lord will open the door so that we can share the good news with that person. That's why we enter the battle through prayer. Third fact is that the Bible tells us that about Satan is that he wars against believers even though we have been delivered from the dominion into the kingdom of God. Peter says he crawls around like what? He crawls around like a lion. <coughs> looking for someone to devour. And by the way, the, the idea of the roar of the lion is the symbol is to give us an understanding that he is a ferocious. It is a ferociousness of Satan to try to consume us. And when he attacks us in order to ruin us, however, he masquerades as an angel of light. Be very careful of this, dear people. The scripture light stands for truth. The scripture light stands for moral purity. And when Paul says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light, he means that Satan tries to convince us that his false teaching is light. It's very easy in our world to be tempted to what we think is the light. It's interesting when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and Satan said to him, cast yourself down, and the angels will hold you up. And what Satan did is that he basically twisted the truth of the Bible. He just twisted it. And 2 Timothy tells us that Satan masquerades can be so deceptive that he actually takes believers captive. I don't think they're demon possessed, but they get captive in terms of the thought process. And the diversion of their minds into false teaching or false thinking and unimportant, we, we dwell on unimportant, peripheral issues and temptations and discouragement, and we doubt what the Bible says. That can't be right. We are at war with an enemy who has thousands of years of experience. All the way back from Satan attacking Eve in the garden. And he's attacking God's people today. He knows his strategy. He, he is locked in. He desires to get us. The scripture also gives us a fourth most important fact about Satan is that he is defeated. Colossians 2 tells us the Christ has disarmed the powers and authorities and made a spectacle through the triumph of the cross. In other words, this is the reason that James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you understand that? When you resist the devil, he has to flee. Because he's already defeated. Satan has lost the war. He's now engaged in sort of, I would say, guerrilla warfare. And we can defeat him, in a, we, and we need to be dealing with him on a day-to-day -day basis, in a day-to-day -day struggle. We do that through the power of the Spirit. And with that, we will allow us Satan to Let me close with this. You may remember a teenager named Casey Burnell. She was a 17-year-old student who died for her faith in Columbine High School back in 1999. Eric Harris and Dylan Klingold, Storm the school, gunned down 12 students, one teacher, before taking their own lives. Casey was a brave young lady. She was willing to take a bullet for her faith. One of the gunmen had yelled, anybody here believe in God? With all the students lying flat on the floor, Casey stood up and said, yes, I believe in God. I belong to the Lord Jesus. The young killer then said, why? But before she was able to answer, he shot her. 
This Iranian teenager died a martyr, but just a few years prior to that, she would have been very easily an accomplice with these two young men. Because when Casey was in ninth grade, her parents became very concerned about their daughter's behavior. They discovered that she was interested in witchcraft, involved in alcohol and drugs. When they searched their room, they found letters which were talking about harming people, harming students, harming parents. Her parents immediately intervened. Casey was enrolled in another school out of the grips of the friends that were giving these kind of evil influence. They regularly searched her belongings and monitored her activities from the new school. But apart from the school and going to church there in Littleton, Colorado, that was all of what her life entwined. Casey reluctantly went on a weekend retreat, a youth retreat. But that retreat changed her life. Her dad said she went away a gloomy, troubled teenager and came back transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. She discovered the joy of salvation which she carried to her early grave. Her transformation can be summarized by the words that she herself shared in the video just two days before she died. She said, you really can't live without Christ. It's like impossible to really have a really true life without him. Just two years earlier, it would have been very easy for Casey to have joined Eric and Dylan, but Jesus changed all of that in her life. With all the tactics of terror that Satan wants to use against us, your people, he doesn't have to win. He doesn't have to win. May we stand firm because of the power of what Christ has given to us in his death and resurrection. Let's bow together. Our great God, we are thankful for your love for us, your care for us. And Lord, despite the aspect of an enemy that comes against us, we're thankful that our trust and our faith is in you, in the power of your Holy Spirit. But Lord, may we be mindful of how Satan attacks and how he twists and turns and gives us the thinking that this is light when it really is darkness. But Lord, we ask that we would pay attention to you. May we read your word. May we understand your Holy Spirit directing and guiding us. And may it always be our lives like Case Burnell. May we glorify you. We're thankful for the power that you have given, for your Holy Spirit within us. Pray this in Jesus' name.